Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening session. We all gather together locally or on the internet to listen to the Dhamma, to discuss the Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma. Today I I got word of a got word just yesterday, last night I think, about a a talk that was being held at uh, at McMaster University. Something about Buddhism in Myanmar and when I got there it was a pleasant surprise. They were talking about our tradition. They were talking about our meditation tradition. It was well, there were others involved but much of it was based around <clears throat> the practice of mindfulness, of insight based on the four foundations of mindfulness, which in a scholarly setting, I mean, it's quite incredible to have people coming from U University of Toronto and the, the speaker came from University of Virginia, I think. It's quite encouraging, and, and the talk was a lecture, I don't know what you call it, the speaker. Um, it was quite encouraging as well. He talked a lot about how mindfulness has evolved, the practice has evolved as it's moved and over time, and the use of the word mindfulness, how it's become such a catchword. And so there are issues, and... and questions of authenticity and and um, uh, keeping with the tradition keeping with the the original teachings right the idea that the word mindfulness has come to mean something different over time And so as a result, meditation practice has changed and people's ideas of what it means to practice the Buddhist teaching has changed. But nonetheless, to hear people and to see a, a picture of Mahasi Sayada up on the up board was quite, quite heartwarming. Even just to hear people talk about him and to talk about the use of, of insight meditation, the practice of insight meditation, have a chance to talk about the, the, to the discussion afterwards got onto the topic of of uh, what is mindfulness and uh, one of the members of the audience was quite bold in his his uh, conception that mindfulness isn't good or bad mindfulness just fixes your attention on an object or something or um, reinforces, I, I, I'm not actually quite clear what is, I don't think I quite agree with it, but um, the question came up whether, and the idea was that a sniper, a, a killer, a soldier, can be quite mindful in what they're doing. A cat can be quite, well, the cat idea was that it was quite focused and yet, if you know anything about the Abhidhamma, these are wholesome mind states. So we have this idea that concentration is wholesome, mindfulness is wholesome, confidence is wholesome. So what about these people who are confident, these evil uh, people who are confident about their evil? People who are confident in scamming, uh, manipulating, uh, in oppressing others. Right? And so I had to I had to give a, a, a sort of a a bit of a correction, I thought, um, to explain I mean, something that's interesting to us because it's an interesting question of karma. What is karma? What is good karma and bad karma and 
how can you say something's good karma when, when, or bad karma when there's so much? It's quite complicated, right? When you say it, it, it actually sounds like some sort of magic, something very m magical or spiritual. When you kill, it sounds nice actually. When you kill, it's bad karma, and bad things are going to happen to you. You're going to get retribution. And so it, it takes on this sort of mystical sort of air. This idea that there's some karmic uh, power or force. But it's not exactly how it works. I mean, karma is, with, with much of the Buddhist teaching, is, is really to be understood as a meditator, as someone practicing mindfulness. You know, karma was this concept that was around before the Buddha became enlightened. But they had the wrong idea of it, so he was just explaining to them what is actually potent. And so what is actually potent is intention. And so at first you think, well, if you intend to kill, okay, then, then killing's bad, but that's not even, it doesn't even, it's not even that simple. Because every moment, if you think about it, when you intend to kill someone, that's one intention. But the next moment you intend to pick up a knife. The next moment you intend to go and find the person you're going to kill. And, and every moment there's an intention. And it's not even exactly intention, it's your uh, volition or your bent, you know, your, your, your inclination at that moment, your state of mind really, jitana. And so I was, I was saying, well, my understanding from the Abhidhamma, I didn't want to sort of preach as a meditation teacher, but I can preach to all of you. So, um, I mean, as we understand it as meditators, karma is every moment. So if you, if you say a killer has mindfulness, well, they don't have mindfulness at the moment when they want to kill. At that moment, there's no mindfulness. They are, they are I'm actually not sure. There's no wholesomeness. It's funny now, I, my Abhidhamma is not clear, but they were saying that mindfulness is also ho always wholesome according to the Abhidhamma, and I'm not so sure. Look at this, I'm going to get myself in trouble. doesn't really matter. We're not we're in, so interested in the technicalities, not right now. So please forgive me for being, um, for being imperfect. But... Uh, the point being, no action is entire. Is it's hard to find an action that's entirely wholesome or unwholesome because wholesome really is referring to the individual, that which brings you happiness, peace, goodness, or, or well, bring good things to you. In other words, things that bring success. So a person's ability to to successfully shoot someone else it actually requires moments of wholesomeness, moments where you are where you are focused and concentrated, present, confident. I mean, the problem is it's, there's so much overarching and so many moments of very strong ignorance, hatred, disregard for people for, for life, you see. And this is, this is true because we're not always thinking about killing a person. Often we're thinking about lifting up our gun and so on. be mostly unwholesome, but there, there will still be moments of wholesomeness. I mean, an easier example might be when you do something good, when a person, when you give a gift to someone, you think, well, that's wholesome, right? We say giving is good. Not exactly. Not necessarily. Not entirely. I remember when we used to give gifts to Ajahn Dog, everyone was so worried. I have to do it just right. And I started thinking, you know, this worry is not wholesome. <laughs> Getting all this stuff, sitting, then we have to sit around and wait for Ajahn Tong to arrive, and he's always late, mm -hmm. kind of grumpy. And you think, well, that's not wholesome. Well, it's much more complicated, you see. 
meditation, many people say, yes, I'm going to meditate. Oh, good. There's a lot of unwholesomeness that comes up from meditation. You see, it's not something to be afraid of. It's not like, oh, well, I better not go and meditate or I'll get angry, right? It's not magic. It's not a, a demon that you have to be afraid of. It's science. It's really psychology. You know, there are things that tear your mind apart, that remove your mind's ability to function, that de debilitate, that decapacitate, uh, that make you incapacitate you, hmm. weaken the mind, cripple the mind, shrink the mind, right? But those are just moments. And in meditation, we're very much interested in studying this. We don't have to be afraid of it. It's like you're studying studying uh, diseases or you're studying pain. Or something. You know, we want to understand it. So we're, we're willing to allow ourselves, give ourselves the room to be angry, give ourselves the space to commit un unwholesome karma, even as meditators. And meditation isn't entirely wholesome. There's a lot of unwholesomeness in insight meditation, getting angry. This is why people are skeptical about it sometimes, and they think you have to do what the Buddha said. You know, the Buddha was inclined to have his meditators because it's, you know, it's much more wholesome to do samatha first, focus your mind, and separate your mind away from unwholesomeness. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of ideal conditions. Uh, nowadays it's, it's much more difficult for people whose minds are consumed and have so much ignorance that we're not even able to tell that these are bad, these things are bad. It's much quicker and simpler for us to you know, just muddle through it and see directly, oh yeah, causing myself harm. So, so good and bad are, are momentary. It's quite scary, actually, if you think about it. Our whole day, every day, throughout our day, we're doing countless, countless unwholesome deeds. We're doing lots of wholesome deeds as well, hopefully. But those deeds are just momentary. It means we have moments of wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. Karma is only really scary when it becomes a habit. Achinakama, it's called. Or when it's extreme, when we let it get to the point where we do something, we have a moment that's just so uh, unforgivable, like killing your parents or um, hurting a Buddha, that kind of thing. Dropping a rock on the Buddha. But that's when it's only really, you know, karma is not something to be afraid of something to understand, something to go beyond, really. It's also not something to get caught up in, to think, I'm going to do lots of good karma and that'll make me happy. We have to go beyond karma by studying it. And this is, so it is everywhere. It's in everything we do. When we give, there's good karma, there's bad karma. When we kill, there's mostly bad karma, but there's still going to be some moments, potentially, of wholesomeness. Um, there could still be moments of wholesomeness. I don't want to get in trouble here with these radical ideas, but uh, it seems to me that there would be moments. Um, but the point is that it, only a meditator can truly understand this. When you're meditating, you're able to see that which causes you suffering, that which causes you peace. I remember when I was hunting, uh, when I was a teenager, and I was sitting up in a tree uh, with a with a crow with a bow. You know, it was the most awful thing to think of now. And I had to sit for a long time and wait. And it ended up being a, quite a spiritual experience. This bird came and landed really right above my head. Listening to the birds floating by, watching, watching the sunset, 
watching it get dark, you know, just sitting alone in the forest up in a tree. <laughs> it starts to get dark. Or, no, it didn't quite get Before it got dark, this, uh, these deer came out into the clearing, and I was, oh, I'm going to get ready, now is the time. But they were, they turned out they were female, and a female and young, and you're not allowed to kill them. You need a special permit. So, okay, I knew I was, and they came right up, and they, they started eating from the tree, right? And I was sitting, in, and I was sitting here, and I was looking into the eyes of this female deer, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she chewing on the it's awful to think back that that was the sort of thing I was interested in, but just to point out, you know, karma is not so simple. You think of Angulimala and all of his intent to kill, and then he ended up becoming an arahant, not because of all the killing, but because during that time he came to understand suffering. You could even argue that through doing evil deeds, a person realizes how awful they are. Sometimes it takes doing an evil deed. Sometimes it takes someone to be addicted to drugs in order to know that drugs are wrong. I don't want to give the impression that, do it, that there's nothing wrong with evil and this is a good thing to do. But it's complicated. The Buddha said himself, understanding karma, only a Buddha can really understand it. But even the understanding that we have is, is that it's not something easy to understand. So I, I talk about this, I thought it would be good to talk about because I want to impress upon you that this is a good way of describing what we're doing in the practice. We're sorting it out. We're coming to see our habits, you know, the karma that we've built up as habits and realizing that some of it's not useful, not beneficial, some of it's outright harmful. And so it's not even about asking whether this is a good deed or that is a good deed. It's about understanding mind state and seeing for ourselves what's what's a good mind state, what's a bad mind state. And you can see clearly, because this one leads to suffering, this one leads to happiness. It's undeniable and it doesn't change. You can never get angry and then say, oh, that was fun. You know, I'm angry and look at how much happiness that brought me. Greed will never make you satisfied. It just doesn't have that, it, it, it has a very distinct nature. It doesn't change. That's the law of karma. That's what we mean. It's a law. It's, I mean, it might as well be a law because it doesn't ever change. Anyway, so in meditation, just being mindful, watching and seeing. We see three things. We see the, 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 uh, the defilement. We see the karma we see the result. This is the wheel of karma. If you've ever heard, never heard of this, there's uh, uh, kilesa kama vipaka or jetana kama uh, kilesa kama vipaka. When you have the unwholesome mind states, that leads you to do things, leads you to kill, leads you to steal, leads you even to think bad thoughts. And then there's the result. And so we see in meditation how different mind states bring different results. I mean, it's a bit, it's, it's chaotic. It's not like it's going to show it in some chart or something. You're not going to be able to chart it. But you'll get a sense. You'll start to see thinking a lot. Thinking a lot gives me a headache. There's delusion. Frustration. Frustration makes me tired, makes me feel hot and sick inside. Greed makes me feel kind of dirty or greasy or unpleasant. Makes me feel agitated, makes me feel hot as well. Burns us up inside. And we start to naturally naturally incline away from away from bad karma but also away from trying to make good karma as we start to understand karma more and more we start to lose our ambitions we start to lose the 
need the drive to do this or that, but become more content and more resolved. You know, it's not that we lose our effort or we become lazy. We become more intent on 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 being, you know, not becoming, but just being. I am not even being, but I mean in the sense of stopping, of staying put, and become very interested and focused and all of our energy goes into not doing any into into stopping, into staying, into being, you know, just being isn't the right word, but what it means is not, not, be, not striving, not reaching. In a sense, striving to, striving to stop striving. Striving to stop karma. Anyway, some scattered thoughts, interesting, uh, very interesting topic. And again, just want to think about how wonderful it is that meditation is, is taking off or has taken off and is really a part of the world. You know, we think of the world as being um, full, of, full of problems, full of dangers, full of, full of unwholesomeness, really. Um, you know, there's a lot of I guess, for lack of a better world, word, there's a lot of evil in the world, if you look at it that way. I don't think it's so useful to dwell upon the evil. You know, there's a lot of talk about activism and getting involved. I'm not going to say anything, I'm not going to criticize it, but I think it's, there's room for arguably the, you know, the idea of focusing on the good. Pollyanna, sort of, if you ever read the book Pollyanna. Or was it a book? Yeah. You know, sometimes if you focus on the good, it becomes your universe. In Buddhism, I think there's, there's room to talk about this, this sort of attitude. If we think about all the, all the meditation that goes on, and we gain confidence and encouragement from that, and we work, and we focus all of our efforts, not on changing the world, or correcting people's wrong views, but but work to support people, and to support the practice of meditation, to encourage others to meditate, to encourage the cultivation of right view. I think this is what has, has, has had this great and lasting impact, bringing goodness to people. And, you know, it's never going to fix the world, but it's um, certainly a good way to live. I think that's the point. We can't fix the world, we can't change the world, but we can live well. We can set ourselves on what's right. We can set ourselves on the right path. And we can have our lives be a, an outpouring of goodness. We do this through many things, but really the core of it is we do it through meditation. So it's awesome to see so many people interested here and and interested around the world, it sounds like, from what we hear. We hear reports more and more of people interested in meditation and mindfulness. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs>